Well, it's time. It's time to do the nasty, and when I say that, I mean making pepper mills. <laughs> uh, salt and pepper sets. That's what we're going to do this week. Uh, if you've been around for a while, you know that I really hate making pepper mills. I just find them so repetitive, and the profit margins on them are not really all that great either. And when it comes to this batch of mills, they're all spoken for because they're going to friends and family. <laughs> So it's going to be a real loss this week. Uh, but anyway, what we're going to do here is uh, I actually need a mill for myself because my wife broke ours. She dropped it. So I'm going to make a replacement for ours. A friend of ours wants uh, a walnut set. And uh, what he really wants is a natural inlay in the top. So we're going to do that to basically know which one from a distance is a salt and which is the pepper one of my sons wants a walnut pepper mill and then a cherry salt mill so we're going to do that for him and my other two children uh, want epoxy ones so i'm hoping that we're going to be able to get four mills out of this i'll split this down the center and then there'll be lots of casting room for uh epoxy so that's what we're doing this week uh anyway it's um these don't get me wrong these are great selling items if you're a wood turner you definitely should look into making these but i want to move forward with more artistic stuff and less production work like this uh after a while it gets very 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 repetitive and it just slowly sucks the life out of you. <laughs> so, so anyway, <laughs> that's what we're doing this week. Uh, first things first, we'll cut this down the center and then we'll get these. I'm not exactly sure how I'm going to cast these, so still have to figure that out. So on that note, welcome to this week's video. <laughs> uh, in all seriousness, uh, pepper mills are decently selling items at shows so you know if you want to be a wood turner and travel basically the show circuit selling your work and or even if you want to do like an e-commerce website uh pepper mills do sell well so uh, i don't want to discourage you as far as making them is concerned i'm just kind of at a stage in my career where i don't really want to do production work like this anymore like i just said i want to really deeply dive into the more artistic stuff so you know <laughs> i will probably still continue to make these for family and friends but uh it's not going to be very often that's for sure so as you watch me clean up the uh the mills here or the the burrow for the mills i just wanted to um thank everybody for watching last week's video those who did and uh last week i basically talked about now that actually is pretty nice I talked about uh, being self-taught and that I'd never taken a class in my life, uh, just books and videos and that kind of thing and trial and error. And, uh, but you know, the, the question was posed to me, well, why did I get into wood turning? So I'll take some time uh, during this video since it's <laughs> over an hour long and uh, I'll cover that as well. There you go, ready for casting. All right, so it's the next day and uh, what I did yesterday off camera was make these little containers. Uh, they're wrapped in tuck tape and uh, quite simple to make. It's two and a half inches across and it's taller than it is wider. And that's so that you can put a lot of resin on there and not have it disappear on you. That way, you know, this stuff here is pretty solid. So I don't think it's going to soak up a lot of the... Uh, the epoxy but anyway it's best to make it deeper than it is uh, wider everything's covered with tuck tape uh, the reason why I wanted to wait a day before I assemble this I put it I put clear silicone on all the joints so we shouldn't have any leaks and the next day when we want to get this out just pop the screws out of here pull one side off and a lot of times you can get it out just like that you don't have to take the whole thing apart but if you do it's not a real big deal and um, pretty simple to make. We've got five different, or sorry, four different colors. 
And what I need to do is measure the volume on each one of these, and then that way I can figure out how much epoxy to mix up. So that's going to be the next thing. This one's going to be the orange one, so I've marked it with an O. Alright, so uh, for those who have never used the rice method as far as measuring how much epoxy you're going to need, uh, the way it's done is in order for this, for this blank and this mold, you're looking at 500 milliliters in height with the red with the uh, with the rice and then what you do is you times it by 1.4 so the amount of space that's around the rice will equal out to about 40 percent of its overall volume so 500 times 1.4 equals 700 so we're going to need 700 milliliters for this blank inside of this uh, this bucket or this container easy so I'm just going to write that down 700 Right, so there's our totals. Orange 700 milliliters, red 840, purple 700, and blue 770. Let's mix up some resin. I'm going to be going for some color separation in these mills, and you'll see what I mean here in a little bit. But uh, we're going to be using the Art Cast for that. It's great when it comes to uh, getting color separation, so that's why I'm using it this week. And that way we can proceed quicker. So one of the mill sets is going to be pumpkin orange and blood red. And the other mill set will be crystal purple and blue. Ocean blue, crystal purple, can't go wrong with those two combinations, that's for sure. Now I do make an error here. It doesn't really affect anything, but I did not lay the corresponding cup in front of the mold, <laughs> the right one. Uh, I was wondering why there was a little bit of resin left over at the end, and then I realized that uh, I basically put the wrong amount in, but in the end it doesn't really bother us. Okay, so the plan now is to put these in the clean room where there's heat and when they get up to temperature, we'll do a pour. And the only reason why I'm doing that is because I want to put one of these is going to be predominantly orange and this one's going to be red and purple and blue. But this is a set and this is a set and I want to just kind of drop a little splash of the other color into it and then that way they'll blend together better, you know, like it'll look more like a matching set. See you in a bit. Okay, we're sitting at ooh, 60 degrees, so we gotta get moving. So if you look at the way the buckets are laid out, the red is in front of the orange and vice versa. The blue is in front of the purple and vice versa. Uh, in the end, it really doesn't matter. The whole idea of measuring this out was to make sure that we have enough volume and we didn't run short on it. Uh, it. Just, you know, things started heating up and I measured it in my clean room and kind of like, oh, I gotta get going here. And anyway, you know how it goes. All right, that's it. I gotta get these into the pressure pot before they set. All right, well, while those are cooking, I'm also get started on these mills. So here we are at the chop saw station. A couple of reasons to do this. Uh, First one is to square up the ends, that way they, uh, they're on the lathe better. 
and also so that I can get a look at the end grain to make sure that there's no cracks or splits in it. And if there is, then I can swap it out and get a new one. This is a center finder that you basically hit the other end of the blank on and there, you can see the raised portion. You just hold it tight in the corner and then it will find the center part for you. Once that's done, I'll be able to take a Phillips screwdriver and just put a little uh, dimple in the end of it. That way they can go on to the pin of the live center and the drive center and uh, things line up nicely. If you do any amount of work like this, definitely get one of these. I got this one at Lee Valley if you're curious. There you go, ready for the lathe. That is an inch and a half spindle rough and gouge by Crown. And it's good to take stuff from square stock down around. Now, when I'm making sets, I don't always make them the same size, but in this case I did. And this is my buddy's mill set. And because we're going to be able to tell from the very top quite easily what's what. So I'll turn one, mark out the other one, that way they're the same height. If they're going to be different heights, I usually make the pepper mill the taller one. The other thing that I do on all of the mills is I mark a line on there like you've seen. And that's just for orientation as far as drilling out the cavity is concerned that you don't get them mixed up because, you know, a lot of this stuff, the straight grain stuff, is not really all that noticeable. But when it comes to this burl and epoxy mills, it'll be absolutely obvious if you don't match up the grain properly. So that's why that um, that line is on there. And also, it's probably not a bad idea to number them as well on both parts of the mill. There, I just bagged up those shavings. I think you may know what we're going to do with those. So one of the main reasons why that line gets on there is so that I know when it goes into the chuck that it needs to be pointed towards the tailstock where the drill is. And I'm not going to bother giving you drill sizes because depending on what mill set you buy, the instructions will tell you what you need to uh, drill it out. That's actually a scoochie gouge that I've turned into a true skew. And the reason why I'm truing up the outside of that is when we reverse this, it should run truer in the chuck. And if it doesn't, then um, <laughs> I'll show you how I do that using the key that goes into the stronghold chuck here. And these are one-way stronghold chucks. So it goes it's turned around oh, it's not running true I just hold my finger on the end use the key in, in, in the belt in the banjo and it allows it to uh, basically run true shut the lathe off and tighten it down that is the scoochie gouge and again you can get that from Lee Valley that's where I got this one it is made by crown and there is a link in the description if you're curious and the tops of the mills get sanded from 180 to 320 I typically don't go any higher than that on straight wood projects so for the body of the mill then of course the bottom is where we need to do the the big drilling so you definitely don't want to do it on the other end uh, this this mill set, uh, the inside of it does take an inch and a sixteenth as the size. I think that's what it is. Uh, again, once the outside's cleaned up with the skew and I clean up, basically get rid of any drill marks that are left behind with that. As long as that's a really sharp skew, it actually does a really good job doing it. And I hit it with, uh, I think that's 180 is usually what I do on the very bottom. That's typically what it looks like coming off the lathe. Once it's reversed, again, it's not running real true. That's how you sort that out. And then I got this drill bit and extension from Lee Valley, but I don't think they sell it anymore. And it's really good, and I, I really wish that they were selling it because I'd like to buy another one. Uh, it runs relatively true, and the drill bit just kind of locks into it. It twists into it. That's how it stays inside. 
Sometimes there's a little nub left over on the inside, so I push that through to the headstock. And then, of course, get some 80 grit and clean out the inside of the body of the, of the mill. Here I'm getting ready to fit the lid, or the, say, the top. And this is why you do the top first. It's awful hard to try and do this in reverse. So try and sneak up on this. You know, if you don't get it, it's not a real, real big deal because I miss it all the time. And I just take either some Kleenex or a paper towel, fit it over the, the, the tenon, and then drive the top onto it. And usually that's all that you need to do. Yeah, that one worked out well. So there it is. That I will do all the mills like this. I'll do all the cavities first. And then once that's done, I'll move on to shaping the outside. Some of these mills did need some repair work done to them. Uh, this is a mill set for my son. And it's just put a little bit of white alabaster in the very top of it. Our mill, I think I use turquoise in ours. Uh, there's some jet black in some, and we will see that coming up. Uh, but it's important to cover the whole end grain or else where your inlay was put in, it'll stand out and be kind of darker than the rest of the top. So it is the next day. Before we pop these out, I just want to show you a couple of things that have come in from subscribers. Uh, Tracy, I'm not going to tell you his last name, was here the other day. Uh, him and his wife come up to this area for two weeks every year and I guess they stay at a cottage and this is a 5 8 bowl gouge from Robust and uh, he actually turned this handle it's some sort of a exotic hardwood we're not exactly sure what it is but uh, you know I don't really have really large hands so this is a little thinner than uh, the Ellsworth gouge that I have so very interested to try this gouge from Robust. Robust makes fantastic tools. So uh, definitely a different grind from what I use. So I'll probably put my grind on it that I like to use. But uh, that is absolutely awesome. Thank you, Tracy. And um, another thing that came in today is a gift from Craig. And again, I haven't cleared any names with Craig his last name but I'm sure I can give you his first name hi Jim a few planets for you hope your build goes off without any major clinches interesting <laughs> sincerely yours Craig now he set these little planets along which are pretty cool I kind of do the same thing as well but all kinds of different colors I'm assuming from his epoxy pores that are left over. So we'll definitely try and work these into some sort of a, a project here in the future. Let's see, I'm gonna ring around it like Saturn or is it Saturn? I don't know. One of them planets. <laughs> Let me go show you a couple I make. So I don't even know if I've shown this before, but the this is actually from the pour yesterday and I pour them into the little silicone planet mold and uh, yeah so I mean his are fancier than mine and we'll see these in the future so thanks again Craig and Tracy I really do appreciate it now I don't know what these are going to be like to get out I'm hoping to be able to knock these out one of the reasons why these tabs are higher is so that you should in theory knock these out and uh, that will allow that to happen uh, there was a little bit of spill into this one it's probably just sitting on the surface shouldn't be any big deal you know once again the epoxy will always keep you guessing. <laughs> like, why would you do that? <sighs> More stuff to fix. That one came out a lot easier.
This one looks good. I guess if I had left these tabs about this long, we wouldn't be having this issue now, would we? Remember that when you make yours. And there's no flaws with that one either. So these won't be a big deal to fix. This being right in the center of the blank though, we'd probably definitely gonna have to do something with that. Might be able to turn that away. It's gonna be a little tough for this one too. We'll have to do something here too. All right, what we'll do is, uh, I've just got the other mills to do. I'm not gonna film any more of that. And then we will be able to move on to these. Before I mount these on the lathe, it's important to square them up. Uh, it will make things faster. I could have made a jig and actually even cut off the corners lengthwise. That would have sped things up. But, you know, it wasn't really that big of a concern, to be quite honest with you. Once these are trimmed up, I'll take them over to the chop saw and then clean up the ends so that uh, we've got nice flat square ends to for the drive center and the live center. And I'm also cutting them to length so that they're the same length, which is important as well. That could be done on lathe too though. All right, so I'm getting ready to do the burl and epoxy mills. And I didn't use the jig where you can use a hammer on this because you might crack the resin. So just use a center finder like this. Marked it with an awl that I've got. And then just drilled a small little hole to fit onto the centers. Now another problem we're going to have, because these are epoxy on one side and burl on the other, uh, there's going to be quite a difference in weight, so probably won't be able to turn these as fast as the other wood pieces. And I will probably wear a glove, because this is probably going to be sending lots of resin shards off. That's the Hercules from Hunter Tool Systems. I did briefly try the one and a half inch spindle roughing gouge and I also have a three quarter inch and neither one of them could touch the carbide. So uh, the, the other thing with this mill set, it, the, all these epoxy mill sets probably took two thirds longer to make than just the straight wood sets. And that's just due to the hardness of the epoxy and the need to go slower with it because you just can't turn epoxy like you can straight wood. Now, one of the main reasons why I get into wood turning was, you know, I, I was looking for something to be basically left alone. <laughs> and I don't want I don't want that to sound the way that it does. Uh, it was me time. There was nobody there bothering me. Uh, I was able to get out and be creative, something that my job at the time, when I was in the military as a mechanic, I didn't get. Uh, you know, a truck would come in, you'd fix it. You know, there was really no visual gratification. That only came if you're maybe overseas and you're working on something that was was blown up or a basket case and you put it back together, then, you know, you could definitely pat yourself on the back. But, you know, a truck's a truck, a tank's a tank, and an APC's an APC, and they kind of all look the same after they were fixed. So seeking for that gratification, that visual gratification where you start with nothing and end up with something, something really cool, was really 
what took me as far as uh, being a wood turner is concerned. Uh, we were over at her, my wife's Uncle Dave's, and he is a wood turner, and that's basically where it started. Uh, you know, he he was on the lathe, and I said, "Oh, it's kind of cool." He was doing segmented stuff, uh, doing glue ups, and then um, finishing these bowls, and he was sending them to Calgary. And uh, you know, he was—I think he was monetary wise—he was doing all right. I said, "Okay, well, maybe if, if this really appeals to me, maybe I can use this as a second income, and um, you know, basically help out with expenses." Uh, it did eat up a lot of my time, and my wife will attest to that. And for the longest time, she really looked at the lathe as, as being almost a curse, if you will. But, you know, in the end, it has paid off. I love what I do, and I love the fact that now that I'm working with resin, I can be very creative. And that's really what stimulated me as far as getting a release from the military where I could just dump all of the stuff that, you know, the daily grind of it and uh, being able to be creative all the while. And that's ready for the next stage. Beauty. All right, so to fix these holes, uh, they may not be an issue. Uh, just depends on how I shape these. But if I don't do something about it now, then it's going to be an issue because that's just the way it goes. So we're going to use the UV resin from Designer Epoxy. And what I've done is I've just tinted it orange. I figured that we'll go with orange. That way it'll match the rest of the orange that's in here. If I try to mix the red, uh, if I, I find when you try and mix similar colors and they're off, they're noticeable. But in this case, by putting the orange in there, you probably won't even notice it in the finished piece. So this UV resin is cured with a UV light. So I'll hold this on here for three to three and a half minutes. And then once this is cure, we'll be able to finish shaping this and move on to the next one. I figure we'll just stick with the same color. It actually looks pretty close. Yeah, that color is pretty much spot on to the rest of the uh, the orange, so that worked out well. See you in three minutes. So getting back to why I started wood turning, um, that's basically it in a nutshell. My first lathe was a 12 inch Henry Taylor tool lathe that had left hand threads on the outboard end and this is where my outboard turning really comes into play. Uh, when I was when I first got that lathe I was trying to turn bowls like normal right handed people would over the lathe bed and of course it just wasn't working for me. And there's that mill filled in now and when that's done you'll have you wouldn't have any idea that that was even there. But one of the face plates that came with that lathe was actually for the outboard end. And once I started attaching stuff to the face plate on the outboard, I'm like, okay, well, this is a lot easier. So <laughs> I went down, uh, I think it had one inch, uh, eight threads per inch, was, was the nut size, left hand thread, went down, bought a bunch of those, uh, had some of the face plates milled out of aluminum as well. There was a guy in the area that was a machinist and I think I made, had made about six or eight of them. And back in those days, I would actually take the face plate, bolt it to the, the roughed out block, or you know, the, the piece that's been just rounded on the bandsaw, and uh, essentially shape the outside of it on a face plate, turn it around, and then of course use the chuck to hold it and take out the inside. Didn't have a coring tool back in those days. And I really threw away a lot of really nice wood. So it kind of bothers me now. <laughs> But back in that day, uh, I really didn't know what I was doing, to be quite honest with you. Uh, anyway, that lathe probably turned a couple thousand bowls, either roughed out or finished. 
And when I bought the 20 inch general that I'm turning on right now, that lathe became obsolete because uh, it was just too small and I outgrown it. But you know, that, that was for me was a really good starting point. I think I paid maybe 500 bucks for it. And you know, that thing paid me back handsomely. So, you know, it, it's just, it's one of these things that, um, like I've said, it's just really appealed to me. Uh, her Uncle Dave doing the segment at work, that doesn't really appeal to me. Uh, I certainly appreciate the work that goes into that. But, you know, I'd certainly be on the lathe than on the table saw and on the jointer and on the chop saw. And, you know, when it comes to segment at work, that's, that's where a lot of that comes into it. And, you know, we may see some of that in the future, but, you know, I just, I'd sooner be on the lathe than, than on the table saw, basically. So if you've been watching the progress of the mill, it's essentially the same thing, repetitive over and over. Uh, like I said earlier, it's just the fact that you cannot go as fast with uh, the epoxy and burl mills. The other thing too, the drilling on these is a lot harder. Not so much on the larger Forstner bits, but on the quarter inch drill bit that I use to go down through the, the top part of the mill, it's got some flex in it. So when you're drilling out these cavities, you gotta go a lot slower than say you ordinarily would if it was just straight wood. Because if you don't, you'll get a lot of uh, uh, bit, bit wander. And then you'll have all kinds of issues with the hole being either oblong or the hole just being too large. All right, so this is my buddy's mill set, and um, he can't, uh, apparently he can't read the P and the S that's going to be on the top of these. He said, he said that he wanted it to uh, be very distinctive when it's sitting on the table, so you don't have to read that. Uh, I think it's because he's getting old and he's losing his eyesight. He's also an only child, so I mean, hey, that speaks volumes right there. But anyway, we're going to inlay one of these with black, and we're going to use... Uh, jet black and this came from Jim D a long time ago uh, I sent me a whole bunch of inlay materials and we'll use white alabaster in the other one for the salt so that'll be the salt and this will be the pepper thanks again to Jim D for sending along these inlay materials uh, the jet black to be perfectly honest with you I do not even know what it is I it definitely lives up to its name because it certainly is jet black. And of course we're going to use a thin star bond for this. And what I'm going to do is saturate the whole top of this. If I just go here, there's going to be a ring because this is the end grain. And, you know, I totally forgot about this when I was making these mills. So anyway, uh, it's, we're kind of doing this backwards because I wouldn't have bothered sanding this out like I did. Anyway, uh, what I'll do is this will probably drink up a bunch of this CA glue. So I'll keep coming back and topping it up to make sure that the inlay is nice and solid. So we can sand this back tomorrow. If you're curious how I made this, uh, I've covered this a number of times in previous videos. But it's essentially a block of alabaster that's been smashed up and then run through a sieve to get a fine material. Well there you go. You'll definitely be able to see that one. All right that's all we're going to do for today. See you tomorrow. Now whatever this material is it actually tooled quite nicely. Uh, it's very similar to the turquoise that he sent. Uh, along with a bunch of other stuff there's some pink coral but uh, anyway it actually tooled up very nicely and it actually didn't really take the uh, the edge off of the tool very much either 
It was sanded out to 320 as well. And of course, we know that the alabaster does tool up quite easily. So I, I didn't have any worries there. And it got sanded to 320 as well. After it was filled again. Finally, on to outside shaping. First things first, true the mill up. Once that's done, I'm going to use a spear point tool uh, from Richard Graffin, I believe. That's also made by Crown. And uh, I like to use it just to lay out the bead areas. And I typically will always lay a bead in where the two pieces come together. Once that's done, I'll use the combination gouge and skew called Skewchy Gouge. And uh, it's just, I don't know, it's very user friendly. Uh, I, I did try to do this with a, a skew and, you know, I gave up on it probably too easily. Uh, I was just getting some really devastating catches with it. And then this is a total different style from the last pepper mill video I did. And that's a three quarter inch middle roughing gouge. And I just like this form. It's probably a more feminine form than it is a masculine form. And um, if you're fractal burning something like this, they typically look a lot nicer as well. Uh, but that's it in a nutshell, basically not a huge um, amount of tool work and that's maybe by design because I just don't like doing center work. Uh, started with the hand sanding then you'll see me switch to the power sanding and the great thing about those dimple discs is you can get down to those bead areas and you don't lose your detail so that's one of the main reasons why I like using these dimple discs as well. So I thought that I would try the inch and a half <laughs> roughing gouge and well, what was that about five passes? I'm like, nope, that's not working any longer. Uh, so anyway, this is back on the Hercules again. Uh, pretty much the same process as the other mills, just slower because of the epoxy. And it's funny, that mill looks like I totally screwed it up, but I didn't. I I actually reviewed the footage, and it's it's actually together correctly. It must have been just a dip in the um, in the burl where the two pieces just happened to come together to make it look like that. But I first looked at it, I said, "Oh man, I must have screwed that up." But when I reviewed the footage, I was like, nope, it's on there correctly. Interestingly enough, I only actually sharpened the um, the Scucci gouge twice during all the time uh, making these mills. Now it wasn't used heavily, like say the Hercules is being used here, or the other the other gouges were, but uh, it seemed to hold its edge quite well, and and I was quite happy with that, especially working with the epoxy and the and the burl pieces here. Sanding, of course, took longer on this because of the epoxy. Uh, but overall, I certainly when I look at these mill sets, I do find that I really gravitate towards the epoxy and burl sets over the walnut. Do I dare say that? Yes, I just did. So the last thing we want to do here is use the triple E buffing compound from the be all buffing system just to get rid of any scratches and then clean it up with some denatured alcohol. And a little bit of slack on the lid is exactly what you want. On the mills where it's actually tight, then you have to mount it between centers and just take a little bit off so that you get the proper amount of slack. Uh, this was a knot in my son's mill and his future fiance. And uh, <laughs> I just used some white alabaster again. And I totally forgot that my wife wanted turquoise in our mill that I was uh, <laughs> making. 
So I had put medium black in there from Starbond. So I ground that out, inlaid it with the turquoise that we've used in the past with some thin CA glue. And I must say that it's a much better choice. All right, so before we put our first coat of finish on, and we're gonna be using Waterlux Gloss, thought I would show this. I've got, I don't know, maybe three or four of these boards. And the idea behind this is, it's not so bad for this one because they're all kind of color coded. But in a normal production setting, you're not gonna have that. So you don't wanna mix up the, the top from the bottom <laughs> of the mill or else it'll be a nightmare trying to figure out what goes with what. Because they all have slight variances. So anyway, this way, you don't, have, you, you don't have to handle them. You can put the finish on. It's gonna go on to the chuck like this and I'll be able to put on my first coat of finish. Same thing with these. I'll slip it on in this orientation and then I'll reach underneath of it. It's not a big deal. All right, so I'm not gonna show these after each and every coat of finish. I'll probably do that at the very end. This week we're gonna be using Waterlux Gloss. Uh, what I should have done before I put that mill on the top was to seal up all the end grain on the top part of that. I don't show it, but I do off camera. Here I am doing the next one. It's really important to seal off any of that end grain because if you're going to get cracks, in all likelihood it's going to come from uh, the end grain that's in any of these pieces. Okay, I lied. We'll show some of these. Show the resin ones anyway. Pretty stuff. Love that blue and purple. <laughs> yeah. Orange is pretty spectacular. You don't drop them though. This is the red one, but it certainly got a lot of orange in it too. It'll really match. Same thing, it's important to seal up that end grain. So I typically only do it once on the top part of the mill. Of course, the very top part of the mill is going to get more coats of finish. But again, it's so important to seal up that end grain. That's cherry. Uh, this is the jet black. It definitely shows up a lot better than I thought it would. And then the white alabaster. I prefer the white alabaster one over the jet black. I like the contrast. You can definitely tell that's going to be salt. That's nice and pretty too. That's pretty nice as well. Almost looks like fire. That's a beauty too. Yeah, there's the top of our mill. Well, all right, that's it for today. We'll see you tomorrow when we're doing the second coat. This is in fact the next day, so to prep each of the mills, I use the triple E buffing compound, then clean them off with the denatured alcohol. And I do all of the mills that are getting ready for the second coat and then move on to finishing. Putting the second coat on anyway. Speaking of that, here is the Waterlux gloss for the second coat. Well, all right, it's finally assembly day. The, um, the kits we're going to be using come from Artistic Wooden Supply in Toronto. And uh, that used to be called Woodchuckers. That is the Pepper Mill Stainless Steel made in the USA. And for the salt, we're going to be using ceramic. And uh, it's important that you use ceramic as a salt mill. And the reason for that is because it will corrode any of the metal including stainless steel so never use stainless steel or any other type of metal 
for your salt mill or else it's going to fail and it actually won't take very long for it to fail either. Uh, the other thing too is you can get these in increments of two inches and really the only thing that changes is the shaft. And um, I find it restrictive. In, inside of each of the kits there's you'll get directions and it tells you how long the body should be. Um, yeah. Right there, it tells you how long the body should be and all this other stuff. And if you happen to make a mistake along the way, then that isn't going to fit the mill that you've turned. So what I like to do is just make them any length that I want to and then cut the shaft to fit. And I'll show you how to do that once we start our first one here. All right, so let's start with a pepper mill and we'll use... Uh, We'll actually do ours. The way that it comes out of the kit like this is not technically the way that it's installed because this piece would be on the other side. But that's the way it comes out of the kits. Anyway, these kits. And you get um, four screws and this is a little bar that keeps the grinder mechanism from falling out of the bottom. They do use, uh, because it's made in the US, there's Phillips screws which are absolutely terrible should be banned from the face of the earth. Everything should be Robinson. And, uh, or square, <laughs> if you will. Uh, I just find that these are easy to strip out, so that's why I don't care for them. But those are the ones that come with the kit. First things first, mill upside down. So this is called the spring bar. So there it is down inside of the bottom of the mill. Then, this is the male grinder goes on the shaft. And I'm not going to put the spring in right now, but, oh, sorry, <laughs> before that happens, this is the female grinder. Not going to be grinding much without that. So this is how much I've got to remove to make this kit functional. Let's measure this. So I need to cut off an inch. Ooh, throw that around. When they're, <laughs> when they're shiny like this, they're actually kind of slick. But I need to cut off an inch. So just measure that out. I'm going to use a pencil. Pencil will mark on this stuff. So there's our mark. Let's go over to the vise. So this is, uh, it's like rubber flooring is what that is. Uh, I'll probably, I don't know if you can still buy it or not. I imagine you probably can. And uh, so I've got two pieces of it, put them like this so that the grooves are facing inwards. This isn't an absolute crucial step, but it's just something that I like to do. And then this will go into the vise. I'm going to leave about three quarters of an inch to a half inch sticking out. If you wanted to cut these off on the bandsaw, fine. I don't see the need for it. Now the end that I just cut off is peened over. So it's mushroomed. So an easy way to do that is just to take your hammer again make sure that this is locked down nicely and then just hit the corners and there you have it it's now peened over as well camera to focus here And that way you don't have to have all these different lengths of mills. 
right? So there's our female grinder. Male grinder on the shaft. Spring is tapered. Make sure that the taper goes to the male grinder. Temporarily put the top on. On the top of each mill set will be a P if it's for pepper and an S if it's for salt. So the other thing too is it's really important to pre-drill. If you don't pre-drill, you run the risk of cracking the wood. And if you don't pre-drill the resin, you really run the risk of cracking that. So this is a 5 64th bit. It's very small because the screws aren't very large. Some of these kits, uh, the screws that are in the bottom are longer than the ones that are at the top. But with this kit, they're the same. Make sure you put, what's this called? Retainer bar is what this is called. Make sure that goes on there. This way, when you take the, the top off, the guts in the mill doesn't fall out. Now, if you want to, you can actually throw a little bit of wax on these. That will work, uh, soap possibly. I don't know if this bit's going to fit or not. So I like to get both of them started before I drive them home. Just like so. Now they're calling this a turn plate. That goes up in here. And again, I will pre-drill this again. There you go. Ta -da. Eight more to go. All right, all the pepper mills are done. Uh, there are some differences, of course, with the saw mill. Uh, first of all, here is the ceramic grinder, this piece right here, and then up inside of the body here, let me take this apart. Well, anyway, the female grinder, ceramic grinder, is up inside of this plastic housing. And remember that you can't have any metal in the bottom of this. Um, there's an S on the top for the salt. There's a plastic retainer bar instead of a metal one. And <laughs> I don't know why they do this, but again, you have different size length of screws. These will go in the bottom. These will go in the, in the uh, underneath the top. Uh, the other difference as well is there is a little spacer that goes on to the metal piece here. And there's probably going to be people ask me what type of metal this is. And to be honest with you, I am not sure. I'm going to assume that maybe it's, I don't know. It can't be, it can't be stainless steel because if it was, it would corrode. Possibly aluminum. These screws look like stainless steel screws. But, you know, they're not going to really see the salt, so that's probably fine. Not very much of it anyway. Um, the other important thing is there's a little spacer. And what that does is it goes on here. And then when this goes inside, it prevents the male grinder from crushing. And basically, if you tighten this down too hard and then you crank on it, you might break the ceramic. So what that's what that little, I believe that's what that spacer is there. Manufacturers put it in there for a reason. They certainly don't want to give up any money when doing so. So it's there for a reason, so make sure you use it. Other than that, it goes together the same as the, um, the uh, pepper mill, and we've already done that. Talk to you in a little bit. 
Well, all right, here they are, all assembled. Uh, one thing that I'm going to have to do, um, it's kind of bothered me a little bit. Some of these mills, I can see some lint in the top of them. I mean, it's just me, <laughs> probably. But uh, I think it's a good idea to just throw another coat just on the very tops of the, some of these mills. Most of the wood ones here are fine, but I'm just not happy with a lot of the resin ones. But uh, other than that, I'm going to do that, and then we'll uh, finish this video up tomorrow. All right, that's going to do it for the video. Uh, I'm not going to bring every one of those mills out and show you. What I'll do is I'll put them in sets on the turntable at the end of the video. That way you can get a decent look at them. Uh, and don't get me wrong, you know, I, I'm not saying not to make pepper mills. But, you know, the, the economics of it really don't fit for me anymore. And I'll, I'll, and I'll kind of lay this out. So I just checked out prices on Woodchecker's site or Artistic Wood and Supply. So for a 10 inch pepper mill right now, it's $22.25. And for a salt mill, it is $15.95. So that's $38.20. After tax, it's $43.17. That's 13% tax. Yay. And, uh, you know, if you throw your shipping on there, well, you're looking at 50 bucks. So for every mill set that you make, now the shipping may not apply to all of them, but you know what I mean. Easily 45, 46 bucks per mill set. And that's not factoring in resin, that's not factoring in finish, sandpaper, you name it, whatever it takes to, to make that mill set, you know, the profit margins really start to shrink on it when you consider that, you know, 200 bucks for a, for a mill set is kind of the standard. I think that maybe that should be a little higher than that because after the pandemic, of course, everything's getting more expensive. Uh, so, you know, I don't do this full time. Like I'm not a pepper mill maker. So, you know, I've only made probably about 400 pepper and salt mills. And, um, but if you're doing it for a living, you're all set up and you got the jigs and, you know, you can whip them out a lot faster than what I'm doing. Uh, but you know, my shop rate 60 to 80 bucks uh, is where I like to be when you factor in uh, maintenance on your equipment, uh, heat and lights, uh, pff, you, you name it, whatever it costs, the structure that you're working out of. I mean, you got to factor that all in there. And then, um, well, you start to see that maybe it's not really so much worth your while, except for the fact that, you know, I've been to shows where People weren't really buying bowls, but they were buying a ton of pepper mills. So if you didn't have all those pepper mills, then you would have went home empty handed. So it's always good to have some variety in your booth. But uh, for me, bowls, hollow forms and vases, that's where it's at. And that's what I really love to do. But by all means, make some pepper mills because you will definitely sell. Them. All right. So next week, <laughs> I got a bit of a problem. Well, it's not really a problem. My son's getting married and uh so we've got a really busy week i'm picking people up from the airport and i'm also um getting ready for the wedding so i don't really have the time to put together the hundred thousand subscriber giveaway video because uh you know we're just about there like it's ninety nine thousand eight hundred and twenty is what it was when i turned the turned the camera on uh, just a minute ago and uh so that's awesome. We're going to be over 100,000 next week, but I'm going to have to defer the giveaway to the following week uh, just because of wedding preparations and all that. So hopefully everybody understands that. Uh, so along with that, last week I asked people to put sandpaper.ca in the comments if they are interested in getting a $100 store credit from uh, sandpaper.ca. And, and for the most part, it was a complete failure. <laughs> uh, so people keep forgetting the dot so all i'm going to do to streamline that streamline that is just put sandpaper if you want sandpaper from sandpaper.ca the hundred dollar store credit then just put sandpaper in the comments by itself and that goes with goes along with designer epoxy if you want to be if you want the three gallon kit at a hundred thousand then put designer epoxy two words in the comments down below by itself and then you'll also be entered into that draw as well. And that's only for Canada and the lower 48 US states for both of those draws. For my draw, I will ship worldwide to whoever's, whoever name gets selected. So please leave a comment down below if you want to be entered into the bowl uh, giveaway. 
Uh, okay, so I've for the most part got next week's project done and it looks really cool. It's more a natural product uh, with some inlay in it. So I think it looks really awesome. So please come back for that next week. Well, I guess that's it. Uh, take care, stay safe, don't forget the bell. Please share my videos with your friends. And of course, that thumbs up will always help beat the analytics. So a thumbs up will help you to push my content to others. So a thumbs up would be awesomely appreciated. See you next week.